Hey everybody. Okay, so we're uh, just going to get started here. Um, so welcome to When Your Wetware Has Too Many Threads. It's going to talk on, well, from somebody with uh, ADHD on how to, to be productive and how to focus, which I know sounds kind of a little bit like an oxymoron, somebody with ADHD being uh, focused and productive. Uh, but I actually was diagnosed very, very late. Uh, I was diagnosed at 34 years old, so I had to spend most of my career trying to figure out some way of uh, working with a brain that just didn't want to concentrate. So I currently work for a company called Nexmo. I'm a developer advocate there. Um, I'm not going to give you a sales pitch about what Nexmo is. I just wanted to put them in here because, well, they're pretty awesome. They've, they're paying for me to come here and talk about uh, neurodiversity. Um, so if you want to hear more about what, what we do there, um, come speak to me afterwards. But really, things kind of started back about this age. So that was me at kind of like, I think maybe three years old. Um, I was an incredibly cute kid. No, I have no idea what happened either. Um, I had a fairly normal childhood. Fairly normal. I grew up in a tiny little hamlet um, in Ireland during probably the greatest decade like the world has ever known in the 80s. We had the best music, we had the best clothes, we had the best films, we had the best shoulder pads. Um, what we didn't have though was a really good way to identify certain mental disorders in children. Um, now, today is a lot better. Um, MRI scans uh, can now detect, detect with 80% accuracy whether somebody has ADHD or not. I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a doctor, um, but my understanding of the, these images, as you can see along the top there, um, you've got this large glowing orange yellow area. What it's actually showing is a difference in mass between a control brain and a brain that has ADHD. So that difference in mass is all focused in the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is, is kind of important. And in ADHD people, the prefrontal cortex is a lot smaller than it is for a regular person. And what it actually controls, well, I'll let this speak for me. complex cognitive behaviours or personality expression, decision making and moderating social behaviour. The basic activity of the brain region is considered to be an orchestration of thoughts and actions in accordance with internal goals. The most typical psychological term for functions carried out by the prefrontal cortex area is executive function. Executive function relates to the abilities to differentiate among conflicting thoughts, determine good and bad, better and best, same and different, future consequences of current activities, working toward a defined goal, prediction of outcomes, expectations based on actions, and social control. That is, the ability to suppress urges that, if not suppressed, could lead to socially unacceptable outcomes. The frontal cortex supports concrete rule learning, while more anterior regions along the rostral caudal axis of the frontal cortex support rule learning at a higher level of abstraction. So, just slightly important, you know, when he controls things like your ability to uh, make decisions, or your ability to um, understand the consequences of your actions, or your ability to, fo to function in a normal society. So for me, my brain is essentially just throwing up four, like five or three errors all the time. You know, I'm asking you to do something, it's come back going, no, sorry, um, there's, been a, there's been a problem, we can't do that, service unavailable. So I've had to like, kind of figure out ways in which to make my brain work in a way that better fits what society expects of it. Um, so, an example of where this didn't work is just before um, I got married. So, about two months before I got married, um, I decided to quit my high-paid, uh, very stable um, job to go freelancing. I had no runway, I had no clients lined up, um, I just decided that this would be a really good thing to do, and I did it without asking my soon-to-be wife. So this is the kind of problems that you get whenever your brain is throwing 503s when you have problems of executive function. And it's, you read all these books about like how to be successful and what it is to be successful and not very many of them talk about having bad impulse control or being flaky or being incapable of uh, managing your time correctly or um, being una unable to stay on task. You know, these are not traits of a successful person. So I had to kind of figure out what success was to me and how I could define success. And what I decided was that for me, 
Success would be the amount of deep work that I can accomplish. So what do I mean by deep work? Deep work is the work that challenges you, that engages you, that, that um, really focuses all your effort. The type of work where a day just disappears and you come out of it and you don't feel exhausted. You don't feel as if you've, you've had to really struggle to focus. You feel like because you've been so enamored with what you're doing that the time just flew, flew by. And for me, the more deep work that I could produce, then the more successful I would be. Um, and the way I kind of calculate this, uh, I know it, the acronym spells out what the fuck, but we're going to just stick with WTF anyway, is the amount of high quality work is equal to the time spent times the intensity of focus. So the intensity of focusing is, uh, is an interesting one. So, so I actually hate the, the ADHD acronym. Um, we don't really have a deficit of attention. If anything, we've got way too much attention. We just don't know where to focus it. You know, it's, uh, it was described to me as being like being locked in a room full of TVs, all tuned to different channels, and the inability to change any of them. You know, you've got constant need for stimulation, and you're just constantly trying to, to find new things to, to keep your mind active, to try and get that dopamine hit fix. Um, if you can channel that, um, that attention, if you can channel that focus, uh, you can really get some really good work done, and you can um, what's what's called hyper focus or, or a flow state. Now the issue is if you can focus that on what you're meant to be doing, that's brilliant. You know you can you can pull off uh, fantastic feats where you can save the day and uh, get something across the lines for a deadline, or you can write the world's best researched uh, comments on Reddit, um, which I've done on a few occasions. But really, the, the important thing is that intensity of focus. If if we give focus a score of one, so a low level of focus, uh, even if we work for 12 hours, then our, our work score is only 12. But if we can get a high level of focus, if we can get our focus up to like a five, then in three hours we can accomplish more than we could in 12. Um, and just, uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about kind of ways in which you can set yourself up to be more successful in training yourself to be able to get to that focus state. And the first one is, is working environment. So for anybody who doesn't recognize it, this is uh, Facebook's offices. They have a completely open plan office. Um, apparently even Zuckerberg's desk is somewhere in that mess. Um, just looking at that image has given me heart palpitations. Uh, I, I would not be able to focus in there at all. I, I have uh, audio and visual um, distractions. So it's not just a matter of putting on some noise cancelling headphones and off you go. You know, the fact that other people are moving about all the time, I wouldn't be able to concentrate currently on what I'm doing. And it's not just me. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Nick, Nicole Millard from BT Futurologist has said the trouble with open plan offices is there a one size fits all model which actually fits nobody. This has been a really well known fact for a very long time. Um, research into open plan offices has shown that even being exposed to the noise of an open plan office for as little as three hours um, can increase your um, blood pressure. It can um, being in an office with one other person doubles your likely, or sorry, increases your likelihood of getting ill by 50%. Um, put that up to three people, and suddenly the number of sick days that people take is up to 70% higher than if they're working by themselves. You know, it's bad for your health, it's bad for your mental health, it's bad for your concentration. But hey, they're, they're kind of hip and they're cool, and maybe it's just we haven't ironed the kinks out of them yet. Well, we've had them for a while. This is an office from 1896. It's an open office. Here's 1900, it's an accountant. It's an open office. 1902. It's an open office. In fact, we've had open offices for a very, very long time. And we actually kind of perfected them back in 1938 with this dude. This is Frank Lloyd Wright. He's more well known for building design, but he also did office design. And this is what he had to say about offices at the time. That the box was a fascist symbol and that the architecture of freedom and democracy needed something beside the box. Okay, he's pretty strong there about his uh, dislike for boxy offices. In 1938, calling somebody a fascist was probably the worst thing you could call them. And in 1939, he designed uh, this. This is his uh, cathedral of work, uh, his open plan office. If you can see there, he's used uh, these, these very, very thin columns, so thin, in fact, that some of the engineers were worried about their structural integrity. But these very thin columns to give it kind of a cathedral-like appearance, uh, forest-like appearance. There's lots of natural light. Um, all the desks were specially designed to ensure that they um, 
while they brought people together, they, everybody had enough space. You know, it really was kind of the pinnacle of the open plan office. And we've kind of been going downhill since then, you know, because people have seen this design, they've seen how successful it was, and they make copies of it. And unfortunately, whenever people make copies of things, the copies tend to be a little bit worse than the original. You know, so that uh, by 1968, they just decided that that open plan office idea just really wasn't working. And uh, Henry Miller got this idea of what they called action offices. They actually took the idea from uh, a organic office movement that was starting in Germany at the time. But these action offices partly came about due to the new cheap materials they could use. But the idea of them was that you would have a modular office. You know, you could have these different dividers that could be rearranged in different ways to create different office spaces or to create areas where people could get together to hold meetings or, you know, it was um, actually a pretty, pretty good idea because it gives you both the privacy if you needed it for work, but also the ability to create these common areas where you could come together and, and work as a team. But again, we have bad copies of them. And by 1980, what we end up is the cubicle farms that we see in office space. You know, so, 1980 to 2018, things are starting to improve a little bit. Um, this is actually our office in London. We use it as an example because it was just designed last year. So hopefully it's, it's modern enough. And you can see we're still doing that awful open plan thing. You know, so we have these open plan desks. Um, looking at that, uh, I couldn't sit on the outside edge because people moving past me would distract me. I can't sit in the middle because then having people either side of me will be a distraction. I can't sit on the far side next to the window because well, I get glare on my screen and I'm just going to focus on the glare then instead. There's nowhere in that space where I'm looking at it going, this is, this is good for me, this is where I would feel comfortable. And they did try to pay some attention. You know, we have, obviously, the open plan areas you know, for everybody to gather, but they also thought about distractions. So they used things like acoustic curtains to wall off areas where people were going to be noisy. So this is like one of our scrum areas. So these acoustic curtains there to, to try and limit the amount of noise and limit the... the uh, the distractions for people in the office. You know, they have these little kind of nooks where you can go if you need some private time to focus on something. But even with this attention they've paid to try and minimize the distractions, this is still my favorite office. You know, so this is my desk at home. Um, it's probably a bit messier than most people. It works for me. Um, and this is where I'm most productive. You know, um, okay, I miss out on like football tournament tournaments and, you know, the free pizza and drinks and stuff like that, but what I gain is control. You know, I, I don't need to worry about whether I'm too hot or I'm too cold. If I'm too hot, I can open the window. If I'm too cold, I can turn on the heating. I don't need to go around and, and pull all my workmates to make sure that they're all so happy with that. You know, if, um, if I want to put some music on, I can put some music on. If I want to dance around singing show tunes because that's what I need right that second to help me concentrate, I can do that. You know, I have the control, I'm, I have the autonomy. And one of the, the key things that we need in order to, to feel engaged in our work is autonomy. Um, the other thing as well is, is the fact that, I want to talk a little bit about dopamine. So dopamine is, is a neurotransmitter. And what dopamine is, is responsible for is basically your, your brain's way of saying, good job. You know, whenever you complete a task, something that like, your brain thinks is, um, is relevant or important, or, uh, so whether it be you've gone to the gym, dopamine hit, or you've closed down that JIRA ticket, dopamine hit. You know, once you do something you, or accomplish a task, that's your brain's way of rewarding you. Unfortunately, people with ADHD, well, we have lower levels of dopamine as well, um, because our brains are awesome, and they just really want to see us succeed. So we don't get that dopamine hit whenever we complete a task. You know, we don't, we don't get that feel-good thing of, oh yeah, I remember to do the dishes for my wife. Dopamine hit, no. Anything that we do is, is done purely driven by willpower. Um, um, so you might have heard of the spoons analogy. So actually the spoons analogy was uh, around chronic pain. It also works pretty well for willpower. And what the spoons analogy is, is that, that willpower is a, a finite resource. You know, everybody only has a certain amount of willpower. So imagine that you have 12 spoons. Getting out of bed in the morning, that costs you a spoon. You know, having a shower, that costs you a spoon. Remember to have breakfast, spoon. So you need to conserve as much of these spoons as you can for the things that are important in your life. Because you don't get any extra spoons. You can borrow some from the next day, but then you're going to have less spoons tomorrow. You know, and, and, and it's going to become more and more difficult from there. So 
Carl Newport and DeepWorks says, in the absence of clear indicators of what it means to be productive and valuable in their jobs, many knowledge workers turn back toward an industrial indicator of productivity, doing lots of stuff in a visible manner. So he uh, basically talks about deep work and shallow work. And shallow work is the things that are really easy to do, but that make you look busy. You know, so whether it be firing off a bunch of emails or um, being really visible in the company Slack channel or writing another memo or, God forbid, scheduling another bloody meeting. You know, these are all busy work. These are all things that make you appear really visible within the company, um, but don't actually really accomplish anything. And we're all kind of... Uh, kind of tuned to do this. You know, we, we don't want to be sitting at our desks um, reading a book or playing Xbox or goofing off. You know, we all want to be seen to be being productive all the time. But you can't be productive all the time. Creativity is not a faucet. You can't just turn it on and expect it to be, to be creative right that second. You know, it just doesn't happen that way, unfortunately. And if you try to force it, well, all you're going to do is just throw away spoons. But when you're sat in that kind of office environment where people don't recognize this, um, well, you feel the need to be always productive, to always be doing some kind of work, so you fall back to this busy work. You know, deep work is hard, shallow work is easier, and in the absence of clear goals for the job, the visible busyness that surrounds shallow work becomes self-preserving. Uh, self so essentially, what we're saying is we create these situations where not only are we making it difficult for ourselves to focus, but because it's difficult, we're then resorting to doing this busy work which is using up any kind of, uh, kind of willpower or any, any time or any ability that we may have, because we're so focused on making ourselves look like we're working that we're not actually doing any work. Now, it's, we've got people like Nathan Hubbard, who um, at Christmas last year was talking about how you know, everybody shuts down for Christmas break. You know, so uh, whatever you're hustling for, take note. Most people, companies are shut down until 2018. That means you get two extra weeks to outwork your competition. That's 3.8% more time for, for perspective. You see in Bolt, one is gold medals running 1.2% faster. This is, this is how ingrained it is in our culture, that we're not even allowed to take Christmas off. You know, it's seen as being like, if you're not hustling, if you're not working constantly, if you're not always in the office with a sleeping bag under your desk or whatever else it is that you need to be doing at that point, if you're not committed 150%, well, then you're not going to be successful. And that's bullshit. You know, Jason Fried, one of the co-founders of uh, Basecamp, says that workaholics aren't heroes. They don't save the day, they just use it up. You know, it's, it's just because you're in the office 15 hours does not mean you're productive for 15 hours. Um, work has this great way of expanding to fill all available space. Um, I used to work at a, an ed tech company who went from doing a five day week to doing a four day week. And our productivity remained the same. There was no change at all. You would expect that we would have a 20% decrease in the amount of work produced, but there just wasn't. We got the exact same amount of work done in four days as we used to do in five, because we now had only four days. Whenever we had five days, well, you goofed off a little bit more, you weren't quite as focused because you had that fifth day to fill. But whenever you have four, then suddenly you're more focused because you, not only are you getting a more rest, you've now got a three-day weekend to recuperate before your next week, but you also um, are more focused within that time because you're, you're working less hours. And the hours is really important. So people talk about crunch time. You know, it's crunch time and we really have to get this done. And, you know, all holidays are off and we're all going to be in 12 hours a day. So this is, this is a normal 40-hour working week. So I'm going to put this in as just like a baseline. So this is, if you imagine your productivity for over a 40-hour week, this is, um, so we've got 40-hour week and we're going to chart it over six weeks. So this is your productivity is fairly linear along that time. So let's increase the hours work to 60 hours. You know, so we're adding an extra 50% on. So we would expect to see that your productivity would be 50% higher. And for the first week it is. And then it starts to drop off. And it drop, drops off pretty quickly. You know, we're talking 10% 10, 10 every week. So by the time we're just over week four, you're actually less productive than you were working your 40-hour weeks. You know, so it's, so crunch time, okay, so that's okay then. So you can do crunch time for three weeks and then take a little break and then go back. And then, well, no, because... We also we haven't looked at error rates. So this is your error, uh, when you're working a 40 hour week, this is what roughly the error rate would be, the number of errors that you're producing per thousand lines of code. But 
whenever you're working a 60-hour week, well, your concentration starts to lapse and you start to make more errors. This is, this is seen not just in, in our industry, but across the board. They've done studies of uh, medical professionals and the amount of errors that, that they produce whenever they're having to work long shifts. They've um, studied it quite deeply within the armed services. Um, obviously very important there. They don't want to be shooting the wrong people. Um, and they've seen that the longer the people are awake, uh, the, the shorter amount of sleep that they get, the higher their error rate becomes. The, the more uh, mistakes that they make, the, the more problems that they have. So we can see in this, in this instance, again, the first week you're, you're kind of okay, but it jumps drastically. By the end of the second week, you're making 60% um, more errors, sorry. You've got 40% chance, a higher chance of making errors. By the end of this, the third week, you're at 70%. Now, it starts to fall off towards the end, and the reason it falls off towards the end is because, well, you're actually writing less lines of code because you're no longer as productive, and if you're writing less lines of code, you're gonna make less errors. But this is just errors. So what if we subtract the, your normal error rate from your new error rate, and let's replot what that line would be? So obviously our productivity is gonna go down because we have to fix these errors that we're making. And that's just for errors. You know, if, if we're so busy focused on getting stuff done, you know, not only are we going to be creating more errors, but we're not going to be like uh, writing tests. So let's let's add in the same kind of rate for for the fact that the problems we're going to get from not having a, uh, a good test suite, and we're probably not going to be uh, worrying about our technical debt. So we're going to have to come through and fix that later as well. So again, that's going to have another time cost, and we're probably not writing any documentation because hey, it's crunch time, and we just need to get stuff out. So. Again, we were, that's going to have another tool where we're going to have to come back later and fix that. So suddenly we see that, well, actually, that crunch time, we're not more productive for four weeks. After the end of the first week, it's actually starting to get to the point where it's really costing us time, and we're going to have to go through back and fix a lot of these things. And unfortunately, a lot of the time what happens is, well, if you're in a situation where you're at, where you constantly have these crunch times that happen, is you don't go back and fix it. You know, your technical debt starts to increase, you, know, you're, you have uh, little to no documentation, and suddenly trying to, um, to go back and fix these things at a later date becomes more and more difficult. It's back to this whole kind of faucet idea. You can't just turn it on. You know, it, it's, it's not uh, something that you can just decide on a whim that, okay, we're going to do 60 hours and we're going to be 100% productive for those 60 hours. It's just not going to happen. Um, I was actually in a previous company. I came in one day and I was completely burned out. Um, we weren't even in crunch mode or anything like that. We were just completely burned out by the fact that I just had to sit in this office for eight hours and try and look productive. And this is before I got diagnosed, so I didn't have my little amphetamine pills to, to perk me up. And I sat for eight hours and I watched that just blinking at me for eight hours. Because as far as I was like, concerned, is this was, this was something that was wrong with me. All my colleagues were fine. They could come in, they could sit down, they could do their work. Why couldn't I do the same? I obviously just needed to try harder. I obviously just needed to spend more time there. I just needed to, to really to, to focus, and it was all about willpower, and it wasn't. I was just completely burnt out. Um, but I still sat there for eight hours and watched the blinking cursor. People think that you're just goofing off, you know, that you're procrastinating. But it gets to the situation where you literally by the time you've thought of what you need to write, it never makes its way to your fingers. So for me, I was like, well, if I'm not here, if I'm not in this seat, if I'm not seen to be here, I'm letting my team down. Or actually, I was letting them down by being there. You know, I was a resource that wasn't being used, but I was still being allocated. So um, if I had just gone home, and I should have been a net benefit to the team because then at least their, their, uh, their sprints would have, would have been adjusted, their deliveries would have been adjusted. So living a satisfying life requires more than simply meeting the demands of those in control. Yet in our offices, our classrooms, there's way too much compliance and way too little engagement. The former might get you for the day, but the latter will get you for the night. This is from Daniel H. Pink. Um, so it's, again, he's talking about this engagement. In order to be focused on something, in order to, to enjoy what you're doing, you need to be engaged by it. And engagement comes through autonomy. And autonomy can be difficult for, for managers to deal with. You know, they see their job as, as being one of making sure that people are in on time and they're doing their work and everything else. That's not their job at all. You know, management isn't about walking around and seeing if people are in the offices. It's about creating conditions for people to do their best work. You know, really, management shouldn't be there to check that your butt's in your seat and you're actually typing. 
you know, that's, that's, that's busy work again. That's, it's easier for the manager to do that. It's easy for a manager to, to fill out timesheets and to send around memos about who left dirty dishes in the sink and all that kind of stuff. It's, that's, that's the management equivalent of busy work. What's difficult for a manager to do is to, to ensure that the work that's being produced is of the, of the correct quality, to ensure that their staff have the conditions that they need to, to produce their best kind of work. I, I was a manager for a while. I know, somebody with ADHD trying to organize other people. Um, but really, for me, it boiled down to three things. You know, you hire good people, you remove obstacles, and you get out of their way. You know, people want to do good work. You don't need to be there looking over their shoulder all the time, forcing them to do it. That they, if you hire the right people, they're going to want to do it anyway. But you need to give them the conditions to do so. So the remove obstacles is probably the most important part, to be honest. And some of it is really easy stuff like making sure they've got the right equipment to do the job. You know, um, so computer equipment relative to the cost of um, people's salaries, et cetera, is incredibly cheap. Get them good equipment. It can be things that are more difficult. Um, so in one place I worked, we had a CEO who insisted on uh, skipping the entire planning process and phoning engineers directly with product requests. So he was interrupting that engineer. Um, things weren't going through the, the proper ticketing channels. There was no accountability. There was no way of tracking it. But he was the CEO. And how do you argue back to the CEO? Well, you don't sometimes. What you do do is you figure out that, actually, the engineers really never use the phone for anything but calls from him. Let's take away all the phones. Suddenly, no more distractions. You know, if you, if you need to figure out ways of managing up the process as well. And sometimes you have ones where it's, it's a little bit more nuanced. Um, I had a, a, a colleague of mine who suddenly was very um, snappy with, with his colleagues. His uh, productivity was way down, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But I ended up speaking to him, and it turned out that his, uh, they'd had a, a child a couple years before, and his wife's job, her hours had changed, and now it essentially doubled the amount that they were paying in child support or child care. And, and that, all it took was to go, okay, well, let's reorganize your hours so that you, you work a four-day week instead of a five. And suddenly, he no longer has that stress. He can manage his um, childcare costs a lot better. Him and his wife are a lot happier at home. And all it really was was just removing that obstacle. And suddenly, rather than having a, a colleague who was snapping at everybody and getting no work done, just by being a little bit more flexible, we had somebody who, again, was very, very happy and also very committed to the workplace. OK, so we have got our workplace sorted out. You know, uh, but how do we communicate with each other? So the team I work for is a fully remote team. We are across uh, three different time zones. So we've got a lot of us are in the UK, so we're in GMT. We've got some here in New Orleans, some in San Francisco. But we also travel a lot. So this is um, this week's. You know, so we now have some, some of the people from the UK. Are, so we've got people in Miami. I'm obviously here um, in the Dominican Republic. In fact, this year, so far, I've been in Lisbon, Vancouver, Budapest, and now Dominican Republic. That's a lot of different time zones. And then next week, we're going to be, I'm going to San Francisco, and some of the people from the uh, US are going to be in the UK, and it's, it's scattered about all the time. So how do you manage communication between a team like that without interrupting your focus? Async communication is key. So we use Slack. Um, those who don't know what Slack is, it's basically a chat application. And most of the time, chat applications is synchronous. You know, you're online and you're talking to people in real time. But it doesn't need to be. So we have things like um, our GeekBot that asks you every morning, you know, basically your stand-up, your daily stand-up. You know, what, what, are you, what, are you, what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? Is there any blockers? Um, it works pretty well. I do think this whole, like, great, have a nice day is a bit patronizing sometimes. But you're like, OK, I've just told you what my blockers are. And you're like, great. Um, but it, it generally works pretty well. And then what we end up with is these kind of messages in our channel where we can see what people are working on. Um, BB obviously had a fantastic time at PHP UK. Um, don't get to say that very often about PHP. Um, you know, she's very happy. She also got taken to Microsoft Build. We can see what people are doing, what they're working on. And this is in the channel, publicly available to anybody all the time. So we don't need to have that conversation of, oh, what's Aaron doing or what's Chris doing? We don't need them to be online at the same time. We all know what we're doing roughly when we're doing it. It also acts as a virtual water cooler. You know, so as well as 
be able to give us visibility on what people are working on, we also can have conversations when we're, whenever we do have these overlap times. So here's a very important conversation um, about mac and cheese, because obviously that's, that's really important, but it gives us the time to still connect with our colleagues. And we use channels a lot, like a lot. Um, we have just one or two, as you can see. And that also means then that we can start to use these channels as kind of different repositories for information. You know, I don't need to be in every channel all the time, nor do I need to have notifications on for all the channels all the time. I have most of my channels muted, but I know that if I want to go in and get caught up on what's going on with a particular product, I can go in and I can see that conversation within that channel. And if, but this only works if, if the entire company is bought into it. If, if half of your conversations are happening in emails and half of them are happening around uh, somebody's desk and the other part is, you know, it's not going to work because you need to have this continuity, this history within a single place. So ours tends to start off in Slack um, and then we move the really important bits off to a uh, shared wiki that everybody can manage. So it's, it's all kept somewhere digitally online where everybody can see. Next bit then is routine. Routine is really important for achieving your best focus. Any of the books that you read, like what successful people do before breakfast is one, or you know, the five habits of successful people, they all talk about routine. And every single one, it's always about getting a routine. For me, this is my ultimate routine. You know, I get up at 5 a.m., um, I work until 8, and about 8 o'clock, that's when the rest of the house starts to wake up. You know, so I need to take the dog out. Uh, my wife starts getting uh, ready for her work, so she's in the shower and stuff. And I know that I'm not going to focus on that time, so I don't try and force it. I take the next couple hours out. Um, I read, or I um, get caught up on uh, some of like my personal tasks I might need to do. But I don't sit and try and f force myself to do my regular work because I know that I'm just going to be burning spoons. There's, I'm not going to get anything done because I'm going to be too distracted. Then whenever my wife um, leaves to work, then I work again from like 10 till, till 3. Because, again, that's never quiet, period. Um, I work from home, so I work best whenever there's nobody else and never flats around me and stuff. And that's my day finished, by 3 p.m. Because I, I know that once I hit kind of like 3 o'clock, that I won't be able to concentrate for the rest of the day anyway. So there's no point in trying to force it. And I know it looks like a really short day, but that's, that's eight hours. Done. You know, when I'm finished by 3 o'clock, I can, I can go to the gym, I get some time to relax and, and spend time with my family, um, I get time to, to read again, and then we start over. It doesn't always work like this because of my job and the fact I travel about 75,000 miles a year. Um, but when I'm home, this is what works well for me, and, and getting that rhythm can kind of be important. And one of the ways you can try and figure out the rhythm is, if people heard of the Pomodoro technique? It's awful. Like you set a timer for 25 minutes and then the timer goes up. So you work for 25 minutes and the timer goes off and you stop working. Why, why are we building in a distraction every 25 minutes? You know, I barely get into flow and then this wee timer's going off. But there's a, a, a variation of the Pomodoro technique called flow time, where instead of setting a timer for 25 minutes, is you record how long you were able to concentrate for and the time that you started, the time that you finished. And you record this for a couple of weeks, and you can then start to figure out what your personal rhythm is, when you're able to be most productive, when you're able to concentrate best. There's other techniques, things like um, uh, getting things done, which allows you to better categorize tasks. I personally, the only bit I like about this is the can you do it in two minutes? That's been a complete game changer for me when I realized that, you know, um, if something takes less than two minutes, just do it now. Stop procrastinating, just do it. You've got things like bullet journals, which are so pretty. Like, this is not a to-do list, this is art. Um, it even has it like a, like a shortened brand name for it. Like, it's not a bullet journal. No, it's not, it's not just any regular notebook, it's a bujo. You know, because we know that's really important. Just ask J-Lo and Kimye. You've Eat the Frog, um, which is pick your worst task of the day and get it done first. You know, if you wake up every morning and you eat an ugly frog, well, your day's just gonna get better from there. You have Don't Break the Chain, um, which I really only wanted to include because of that stock image, it's awesome. Um, break the Chain is, is where you, um, basically you're, you're trying to trick yourself into getting into a streak that you don't wanna break. So if you do manage to focus every single day, then you don't wanna break that chain. Um, 
things. You've got the Moscow method of must, should, can't, won't. You have time boxing. You've got all these different things. But really, for people with ADHD, we aren't good at ordination. Planning and doing parts of a task in order tasks in a neurotypical world have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Individuals with ADHD don't know where and how to start. You know, organization becomes unsustainable tasks because organizational systems work in linear importance and time. And that's, you just gotta sometimes have to kind of work with what you're good at and what you're not. I'm really bad at organization. This is, this is what I use, post-its. Scribble it down and slap up my monitor. You know, if it's there and it's visual, then it gets done. If it's not there, then it doesn't exist. If it's not, it's, um, I once changed jobs and uh, managed to erase my entire calendar. Um, and missed every appointment I had for like the next six months, um, including my appointment for my psychiatrist about my ADHD. Um, but yeah, but for me, I need something visual. I need something that's there on my monitor that I can work with. And that's, that's what works for me. There's so many other different techniques um, out there. You can try and find one that works for you as well. That's my Twitter and my works Twitter. Um, I'll post links up to some of the different techniques that I kind of very quickly went through at the end there, um, as well as kind of these slides and things. Um, if you have any questions about being not neurotypical um, or ADHD or uh, depression or anything like that, I'm, my DMs are open, um, drop me a line. But yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. After I completely, so um, after I completely burned out, so the question was, how did I get diagnosed? So I get diagnosed at 34. Um, I had been struggling for a very long time, was completely burned out. Um, but also had a major depressive disorder, which I was going to a doctor to see about. And I was just very, very lucky in the, the GP, the general practitioner that I, yeah, he actually was um, the head of adult ADHD research for a university in the UK. And just sitting in his office, he noticed a lot of my little twitches, a lot of the little mannerisms I have. And he was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get your depression sorted. And then I'm going to send you to a psychiatrist because you've got ADHD. <laughs> and it took about a six-month process from there to, to get the final diagnosis. Um, but it was, for me, it, it was just pure luck, to be honest, that that was my GP and that he had that, that experience. Any other questions? No? Cool. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>